welcome to the Diction Police. I'm your host, Ellen Rissinger, an American vocal coach accompanist on the music staff of the Zempel Oper in Dresden, Germany. The Diction Police is just starting its ninth year. I started the podcast on April 1st, 2010, and it's been amazing to watch it grow year by year to meet so many fellow diction geeks and just to talk about diction with everybody. Thank you all for being a part of that. In this episode, my partner in crime, François Germain, discusses the text to Sophie's aria from Werther with us, with an emphasis on consonants that should not be pronounced, but often accidentally are, the spelling O-Y, and how to avoid stressing unstressed syllables. For anyone attending the Classical Singer Convention this year in Boston, François will be there representing the Diction Police, so please stop by and say hello. For more information about François Germain, or for the accompanying PDF of this text, which includes an IPA transcription, along with the poetic and word-for-word -word translations, please visit DictionPolice.com. You can also follow the Diction Police on Facebook or Twitter, at Diction Police. Werther was composed by Jules Massenet to a libretto by Édouard Blot, Paul Milly, and Georges Hartmann. In Goethe's original Die Leiden des jungen Werthers, The Sorrows of Young Werther, Sophie is only mentioned once, simply stating that she's the eldest of all of Charlotte's younger siblings. Her role is fleshed out in the opera as the perfect foil of youthful happiness for all of the sorrow that the rest of the characters must go through. In this aria, she tries to cheer Werther up by mentioning a party that evening, telling him that she expects him to dance with her. Frères, voyez, voyez le beau bouquet. J'ai mis pour le pasteur le jardin au pillage. Et puis on va danser. Pour le premier menuet, c'est sur vous que je compte. Oh, le sombre visage. Mais aujourd'hui, monsieur Werther, tout le monde est joyeux. Le bonheur est dans l'air. Du gai soleil plein de flammes, dans l'azur resplendissant, la pure clarté descend de nos fronts jusqu'à notre âme. Tout le monde est joyeux, le bonheur est dans l'air. Et l'oiseau qui monte aux cieux dans la brise qui soupire est revenu pour nous dire que Dieu permet d'être heureux. Tout le monde est joyeux, le bonheur est dans l'air, tout le monde est heureux. One of the things that I end up coaching all the time is the fact that this O-Y sound should be comparative to the O-I in French, right? Yes, O-Y is one of those two letter combinations that, that actually create a sound that doesn't look at all like what it means. And in, in this case, you're right, O-Y functions as O-I, so we're going to have uh, wa, the W, bright A, phonetically. Which we would recognize later in the aria with the word for bird. Oiseau, where we have O-I at the beginning of the word, and that's the same, the same sound. The one difference, however, is that with the O-Y, the Y is, uh, also functions still on its own as a J line in this case. Okay, so we get both. We get the Wa, which goes to the bright A phonetically, W bright A. Exactly, and then the, the Y will also trigger a, a J line in this case. So we don't have Voye, but Voye with the, the J line in between. Okay. And we have so many spellings that we always have to learn in French, and one of them is E-A-U. Yes, that's a good one to know by heart. E-A-U is going to be a closed O, always. Exactly. Not to be confused with the E-U's or the A-U's, because they can be different than that. Right. So the E-U's will either be uh, an open OE, a closed O slash, or a lowercase Y. Mm -hmm. So these are complicated, but yeah. that's not what we're talking about here. For once, <laughs> it, it was simple. The EAU is closed O, and so is the AU. It's mostly closed O. Okay, so just for some examples, we have... Mais aujourd'hui, we have the AU, that's closed O. And for the EU, we have several. Yes, there's, there's always a lot of those in, in the language. So we have tout le monde est joyeux. EU followed by X in this case closes the, the vowel to an O slash. And in the next verse we have bonheur with the OE uh, instead of the O slash because it's followed by a pronounced consonant. So basically if it weren't followed by a pronounced consonant like this X at the end of joyeux, we're basically going to have the closed vowel. That's correct. And I believe we have a diction tip about this on the website. We actually do, yeah. 
<laughs> we see this later in the aria too. Aru. So um, Aru is, is interesting because it, it has both both cases uh, within one word. The first EU is actually an OE because it's followed by a pronounced consonant, the R. And the second EU is the O slash because it is followed by um, a silent consonant or, or no sound. It's, it's the final sound in the word. And this is actually another thing that I know we've done a diction tip on, but it's important. What do we need to know about vocalic harmonization in, re in regards to a word like this? When we say about vocalic harmonization, these words are basically what we're talking about, right? Yeah, so the vocalic harmonization is when you have two pairs of, of vowel sounds where there's an open version and a closed version. Uh, and when you have the open version first, you, you can elect to actually close that open vowel to match the, the second vowel that's closed. So does it become as closed as the second one, or does it just sort of head there? Well, technically, it's harmonizing, so it's, it's not equalizing. It, it goes toward that second vowel, but it shouldn't really be the same vowel. So it shouldn't really be uru. If, if you're going to, to use harmonization, it's, it's going to be somewhere in between the, the uh and the u. It's just it's sort of a way to to make the the sequence of vowels just a little bit smoother sometimes, and uh, in the context it can uh, be helpful. I find that most of the time it's actually not that helpful, and you can really retain the clarity of each individual vowel sound without making it too complicated. Yeah. Well, while we're talking about clarity of vowel sound, one of the things I love about French is the fact that you can often find vowels that, that are based on the same, either the same tongue shape or the same mouth shape, and use that to keep you in the same spot. So we had talked about the phrase, tout le monde est joyeux, le bonheur est dans l'air. And in a case like this, we have a lot of vowels that have either an open e mm -hmm. or the open o lips that yes. we can just maintain, right? Well, I think that's the benefit of having a language that has that many vowel sounds. When you have that many sounds, that means that they're also, the differences between sounds that are adjacent is, is fairly small, so you're bound to find a series of vowels that are closely related. Yeah. And, and, and the, the verse you're, you're talking about here, uh, le bonheur est dans l'air, all these vowels have in common the open e, or, or an open shape, yeah. so to speak. But there's a lot of open e's actually in here. So, you know, we have the first word, le, with a schwa, which is the inner shape of open e with the lip shape of open open O. It's because it's the equivalent of the OE. The OE, exactly. And followed right away by the open O of bonheur. So already we have two vowels that have open O lips. Yeah, so the lips can stay. We just change the tongue shape. That's right. Then we come back to an OE. So we just sort of go back and forth. Uh, and that means that the lips still haven't moved. And then we go to an open E. So again, we just, you know. So this time we leave the tongue. We, we change leave the, the tongue. Lips. We just switch the lips. Then we have a little outlier with the don, which is the, the least related of those vowels, but then we come right back to an open e with ler. So you can see like even in a short verse like this, where there seems to be a lot of different sounds, they're all part of the same family, so to speak, in one way, they're all related in some way, whether it's through the lip shape or through the, the tongue position. Exactly. There are a few more things in this recitative that are, I find very interesting, one of them, is the fact that we get the upside down H glide that's not going to the lowercase i, the phonetic e sound. I mean, we, we get it both actually. We get. We get aujourd'hui, which is the, that's the common, the most common um, occurrence of the upside down H when it's followed by the phonetic e, so lui. But we get the other possibility for that upside down H, which is when it's followed by an open e in the case of menuet here. And that, we find that much less often than the E sound, right? Much less often because usually these words are actually words that uh, separate those two sounds into two separate syllables. So it should be a menuet. But in this case, the composer elected to uh, set this on one note. So therefore, we actually use a glide and not a full vowel for the, the U sound. And instead of having a lowercase Y, like we normally would, we end up with an, open, uh, an upside down H. So menuet and not menuet. But it's also not menuet. And it's definitely not menuet. So <clears throat> that's the difficulty with the upside down H. So you have to make sure that uh, when you start that glide, you're really shaping a, a lowercase y and not a w. Exactly. And for, for foreign speakers, especially German natives and English natives, it's sometimes very difficult to actually even hear the difference because the glide goes by quickly and uh, it's, it's easy to have a little bit of a w sound get in there and menuet instead of menuet. 
And by that, you have to be very, very clear with that. It's a, it's a small difference, but it, it's one that uh, French ears will pick up right away. Yeah. And just because I know this is something I learned from my friend Nathalie Doucet, the ET ending of, on a word, on a noun, is oftentimes an open vowel. Yes, most of when, yeah. when you have a final ET at, at the end of the word, you go for an open E. We have that at the very beginning with the word bouquet. Uh, it's not bouquet, it's not menuet, but bouquet and menuet. And also in the, in the recitative, we have another word that I find really interesting to memorize, or very important to memorize, because this word comes up seem, rather often for a word that you wouldn't think of. Je compte. So this is the verb compter, but it's spelled with a P. Yes. But we ignore the P. Yes. And I, I think this word compter is, is important to memorize because when there's a P followed by a T in the middle of a word in French, we don't always know whether the P gets pronounced, right? No, and I think there's a natural tendency to want to pronounce them, but you should, you should double check because some of them will be pronounced and some of them won't be pronounced. In this case, it is silent, so it's compter. But you can have a word like uh, somptueux, for instance, uh, sumptuous, where it will be pronounced. So you, you know, better better be sure and look up look up in the dictionary. Yeah, especially if it's a word you don't you're not sure of or you've never seen before. And I would also say, especially if it's one that looks like something in English, like the word for prompt. That's correct. So prompt, uh, prompt uh, in English, you pronounce it, but in French you don't. So it's in French. And it looks very strange because it's way too many letters for just one sound, <laughs> but uh, that's what it is. And, and one last note on that word, um, the O-M spelling is the O nasal. It's one of the possible spellings for uh, the nasal vowel with a closed O. Uh, typically, you, you find these as O-N, but whenever you have a P or a B, that N uh, as, 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 a, as children, we learn that the N turns into an M, so mm -hmm. you will never have an O-N-B or O-N-P, but always O-M-P or O-M-B. Well, because the basically the the orthography then assimilates the consonant to where the consonant where the following consonant would become pronounced. So that's a very technical explanation. Yeah. That's probably <laughs> that's probably correct actually, but that doesn't really apply for French because we there, none of these consonants are actually pronounced. But <laughs> it might be a remnant of when they used to be uh, pronounced. Yeah. Yes. So if, if you want to think about it that way, that's actually yeah, yeah. interesting too. Since we're making that point, whenever we have a consonant, an M or an N, that does become a, a, a nasal vowel, we then do not pronounce the N or the M. That's correct. That's one of the biggest topics that I find myself coaching all the time. The necessity for a completely pure nasal vowel in right. all contexts. Very often what you will hear is just a little bit of an M or a little bit of an M or an N creep in, in words like le sombre visage or tout le monde est joyeux because people anticipate the next consonant that's correct so i think there's two things that happen or maybe there are two things that happen one is that the the brain sees the m and the n and wants to do something about it mm -hmm. or we're used to the italian where things are pronounced and there's there's sort of a reflex to, to put them in uh, but sometimes even when you know they're not supposed to be pronounced you will see it hear them, and that's because of what you just said, where the singer will anticipate the next syllable, in this case the B in sombre or the D in monde. And when you do that, on the way to that B or on the way to that D, the tongue and the lips will articulate something that sounds like an, a sort of a ghost M and a ghost N. And that's a big no-no. Like You really have to be careful to sing the vowel, so in this case the closed O, with not too much nasality, but you have to sing that vowel for the whole length of the note and put the next consonant really at the beginning of the next syllable. So not sombre, monde, but sombre and monde. Which goes along with our, our logic of really long vowels and single consonants always in French too. Yes, and that, that is also one big topic of French and when you coach French is uh, you, ha you always have to remind singers that this is a vowel-oriented language and you have to sing the vowels as long as they can possibly be sung without altering the, the rhythm. But you have to connect vowel to vowel, and the consonants have to really be at the beginning of the next sound all the time. You can't have any effects of anticipation. It sounds very, um, very odd. It sounds, first of all, un-French, but also you lose a lot of the legato. Mm -hmm. Well, going along with that, right at the beginning of the aria proper, we have a consonant cluster in the middle of respirant 
So in a case like this, we don't want to say resplendissant as we would in, in Italian because we would chalk the, the syllable into the vowel. That's correct. And, and if you think about the syllabification and the way things are sometimes separated in your scores, <clears throat> it's very possible that you will have uh, R-E-S, a little space, and then P-L-E-N. And that, that makes you feel or think that you should sing res and then plendissant. So separate in the middle of the cluster. But really in French, you should not do that. You should really sing the open E and then pretend that that S belongs to the PL. So it's res, plan. Splan is the next sound. It's exactly. not res, plan, but res, plan, disant. And every consonant sound, whether it's a, a consonant sound on its own or a cluster, should really start the next syllable all the time. Mm -hmm. And one last thing that I want to make sure we talk about are these closed O's because this O nasal is based on the closed O. We get a closed O and a closed O nasal back to back in this aria. De nos fonds jusqu'à notre âme. Yes, yeah, so in this case, the closed O twice in a row. The difference between the two, obviously, is that the second one is nasal, uh, but I always try to encourage singers to really denasalize their nasal vowels uh, because if you, um, if you sing your vowels in the nose too much, uh, if you lower your soft palate too much, then you lose a lot of resonance. In a case like here, in order to, to hear the difference between the two sounds, you might want to actually put a little bit more nasality than mm -hmm. if, if the front was uh, on its own. But because you have no front, you do want to have a little bit of difference between the two vowels. Otherwise, uh, we might not completely understand what you're saying. But um, I guess the important point is that for that nasal vowel, the, the first order of business is to really establish that underlying vowel very clearly. And in this case, it's the closed O. Which in French is like almost like in German, super closed. It's very, very rounded, yes. Uh, it's almost like tot in German. We talked about anticipating consonants and thereby accidentally pronouncing an unpronounced N or M after a nasal vowel. But this can also happen very often at the start of phrases, especially ones that begin with a voiced consonant. As an example, look at the start of the aria, du gai soleil. Many, many singers like to check if their voice is working or if they have the correct pitch, that everything is phonating. And then they accidentally sing an N before du, n du, n du gai soleil. This can occur in any language, unfortunately, and it can quickly become a very bad habit. It's also a very difficult habit to be aware of, so it's definitely something to pay attention to. Trust your voice, trust your technique, don't test the note to see that it's there. There are very few liaisons in this aria. Early on, we have mais aujourd'hui, where we need to hear the Z sound of the S, and right at the end, we find tout le monde est heureux, where we need to hear the T. But we do not want to make a liaison in the phrase le jardin au pillage. As awkward as it is to have these two vowels back to back, an open nasal E followed by a closed O, the noun jardin is in the singular, and we seldom make a liaison after a singular noun. One last point. It's all too easy when an unstressed schwa occurs on a beat to overemphasize it. And in the very beginning of this recitative, we have the phrase frère voyer. Even though the schwa ends up on a beat, it's very important to unstress this syllable. In normal speech, this syllable wouldn't even exist. So if it gets an accidental stress, it sounds distorted. And although Massenet has very few markings in this aria, which is unusual for him, he does put a tenuto over the first syllable of frère, which to me means that he's also trying to make sure the singer doesn't stress the wrong syllable. The simplest way I know of to achieve this correctly is to only feel one beat per measure. Rather than thinking frère voyez, think only of the first beat, frère voyez and this can help keep the word stress intact. Frère voyez, voyez le beau bouquet, 
J'ai mis pour le pasteur le jardin au pillage et puis on va danser. Pour le premier menuet, c'est sur vous que je compte. Ô oh, le sombre visage Mais aujourd'hui, Monsieur Werther, tout le monde est joyeux, le bonheur est dans l'air. Du gai soleil plein de flammes, dans l'azur resplendissant, la pure clarté descend de nos fronts jusqu'à notre âme. Tout le monde est joyeux, le bonheur est dans l'air, et l'oiseau qui monte aux cieux dans la brise qui soupire est revenu pour nous dire que Dieu permet d'être heureux. Tout le monde est joyeux, le bonheur est dans l'air, tout le monde est heureux. This interview with François Germain was conducted by Ellen Rissinger. Phonetic transcript by François Germain. This has been the Diction Police Special Diction Unit, a production of Singing Diction Gébé Erro.